Good morning, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this webinar co-organized by the Brazilian Center of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, the Symbiosis from CNPq, together with the Biota program uh, to discuss issues related to the trends and perspectives of synthesis science. So how uh, uh, the science of doing synthesis, how we can do that. So we will have today the opportunity to discuss what is the science of synthesis, uh, what is the contribution of this approach in advancing knowledge, uh, how it can contribute to sustainable transformation in society, and how it contributes to the training of a new generation of researchers, promoting a more collaborative way of doing science. Uh, all these topics are particularly relevant to be discussed in the Brazilian context, considering that we have uh, uh, Symbiosi has recently launched its first call, and we have uh, seven active working groups now. And now, more recently, we released the new joint call between Symbiosi and Piotta, together with the French Synthesis Center, the CESAB, and also with the CEBA, which is the French Center for the Study of the Amazonia. So I think we have now a broad community in Brazil getting initiated, beginning work, working with the science of synthesis. And to discuss with us, uh, it's a privilege to have today two experts on the topic, uh, Diane Sherry Vastava and Ben Halper, uh, who I thank in advance for their willingness and kindness in accepting our invitation. It is also a great honor to have for the opening session of this webinar, the presence of the scientific director of APESP, Professor Luiz Eugenio Melo, and also the president of the CNPq, Professor Evaldo Vilela. And I, to start the opening session, I invite both Professor Melo and Vilela to open uh, their camera uh, and to join me in the screen. And I will initially invite Professor Luis Eugenio for the welcoming words. So, Professor Luis Eugenio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jean Paul. Good morning, good afternoon, good night to you all, as this uh, session is uh, being recorded and may be uh, seen uh, in different time zones. That's uh, currently the way to start. It's a great pleasure uh, for me, as scientific director of FAPESP, to uh, be on this opening event. It's of great importance for FAPES as this agency some 20 years ago created the BIOTA program, which has been a very successful initiative towards the better understanding of how biodiversity is distributed, not only across the state of Sao Paulo, but also in Brazil and over, wide, over the globe. The synthesis initiative, which may be uh, may not be new uh, in the world. It's uh, uh, quite uh, new for us in Brazil, and we have a lot uh, to learn uh, to this. And uh, I hope that uh, this event might contribute uh, to our better uh, uh, developing uh, of uh, initiatives on, on this matter. So once again, uh, thank you, Jean Paul, and uh, I wish you all a great event. Thank you, Lisa Genio. Uh, I will call now um, Professor Evaldo Vilela to for give the welcome words, please. Professor Evaldo. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to participate in the opening of this webinar. And I would like, in the first place, to thank the speakers and the organizers, both from FAPESP and from CMPQ. It's a great opportunity to bring to the Brazilian scientific community the curious discussion about synthesis and science and its impacts on the academy and society. These are very important talks in the context of science frontiers advancement and also in the search for bringing closer science and decision making. This is a crucial gap Symbios proposed to help fill in in the area of biodiversity 
and ecosystem services. SimpleQ through CBOs has a pioneering role in promoting this discussion in Brazil and dialoguing with the national and international community in the process of developing a Brazilian model of thesis center. Today's event is also important in the context of current discussions of trends and perspectives of the future of thesis science in the pandemic and hopefully soon post pandemic world. It became even more relevant, but has big challenges to face. How to promote international transdisciplinary collaboration for cutting edge research that will help us cope with the current and expected multiple crises in the near future. What lessons do things as science brings up us about science making in this complex world we live in? About science communication and science society relationship. These are open questions. We invite our community to think about in their open mindset. Even thought we have serious funding limitations in Simplicure. We are strongly committed with CBOs and we will make all the necessary efforts for this endeavor to succeed and fulfill its role as a reference and convergence organization in the national agenda for biodiversity and the ecosystem services, which is a strategic to our culture. I wish you all an excellent event with fruitful discussion that may lead to new ideas for future thesis groups and to further collaboration. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to FAPESP for the organization for bringing us here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Evaldo. Thank you, Professor Luis Eugenio, uh, both for the welcome words and also for the support and commitment from both CMPQ and FAPESP to this initiative that I really think it's important. Uh, before introducing our guest, I would like to make some few announcements. The first one is that the audience can send questions to the speakers using the Q&A option from the Zoom platform. Uh, we will try to answer all those questions along the webinar. So it's one hour and a half of webinar. And the webinar is being recorded and will be made available soon through the Agência FAPESP and also through the CNPQ YouTube channels. So, um, now introducing our first speaker. So our first speaker is Diane uh, Sherivastava. Uh, she is the director of the Canadian uh, Institute of Ecology and Evolution, which is the Canadian Citizen Center. And she is also professor at the British Columbia University in Vancouver. And she works with a wide range of topics, including the ecology of aquatic insects inside uh, water filled uh, bromeliads. Um, she works also on functional effects of tropical fragmentation and food web ecology. But today, Diane will talk about uh, the science uh, of synthesis. So, Diane, welcome. Thank you for your participation. And the floor is yours now. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this invitation. Um, it's a real pleasure um, to talk to everybody. Um, so today, uh, what I'm really going to do is make a pitch for working groups. Um, you're going to hear a lot more uh, quantitative detail from Ben Halpern. Um, I'm going to paint kind of a broad brush uh, picture. So, um, 
why working groups? So I imagine that uh, some of you in the audience um, have participated in, in working groups and I look forward to hearing about your experience um, in perhaps part of the Q&A session. Um, and uh, others of you have not participated in working groups and are here because you're wondering what the big fuss is about. So let's start just by asking what exactly is a scientific working group? Well, the group part of it uh, is obvious. It's a group of people, but it's a group of people who meet together. Uh, they have diverse skills, knowledge. Um, they work collaboratively to synthesize either data or ideas um, in order to advance science. So uh, these working groups are generally about eight to 14 people in general. Um, uh, I've given you, a, I thought um, Brazilian researchers would like to see a group of Canadians doing science in the snow. Uh, so here's a, a CIEE working group. The, the key elements of a working group um, are several fold. First of all, I'd like, to emphasize the synergy. So um, you're bringing together different knowledge and skills and there's synergy when you do that. I'd also like to emphasize the word synthesis. So you are integrating um, and synthesizing existing data or concepts. And of course, the question that you're trying to answer is important because you wouldn't uh, bring ask uh, all these people to put their life on hold for a week long meeting if it wasn't an important question. So as I've already uh, alluded to, traditionally working group meetings are one week, that is like five consecutive days, um, but they can be more distributed through time. For example, you could meet once a month. Um, and certainly as we are, have been doing a lot of these virtually in the last year and a half, um, that mode of operating has become uh, more popular. The goals of working groups can be very tightly focused as in say a meta-analysis or they could be much more blue sky. So that's kind of in words what a working group is. Let me show you in pictures what a working group is. So let me show you the, um, what a day in the life of a working group meeting might look like. So in the morning, um, you could start with a, with a plenary. So a full group discussion uh, and in this morning meeting, you might decide on how you're going to tackle uh, this question that's in front of you. Um, you might obtain consensus on some of the uh, important uh, uh, um, uh, points. Um, and then you might divide into tasks the job ahead of you. And you could have different breakout groups um, that uh, work on each of these tasks. For example, you could have a small group that worked on uh, the conceptual development of a question. Could have another group of coders who is working on uh, synthesizing the data. Uh, and you could have a group of um, people who uh, would build models. And then after these breakout groups uh, uh, do their tasks, you might meet together as a full group in the afternoon, have an afternoon plenary session where each of the breakout groups reports back. You figure out what the issues are, you as a group, you get consensus to resolve those issues and you plan your next, next steps. Okay, so as the organizer of a working group, this might be your vision for how you structure your day. But of course, the magic of working groups is not just this planned structure. It's also all the unplanned events that happen during this day. So for example, at 10 o'clock in the morning, it could be that um, members of the conceptual team and the model team uh, were chatting over coffee. And in that period, they came up with a really, really, really brilliant idea of how to build a model that uh, tests one of the concepts. It could be that in that afternoon plenary session, the group suddenly realized that they have, there's a totally different question that they could also answer with the data that they've collated. And that's why these working groups often lead not just to the single manuscript that might have been envisioned in the beginning, but a flowering of um, outputs. And it could be that the dinner that the team has in the evening helps build um, a lot of trust between team members. They realize they really quite enjoy each other's company and they uh, trust each other for their most fragile ideas. And that's what 
the ingredient that's necessary um, for uh, this type of deep thinking. So why are working groups so effective? Well, I've already told you a little bit about the method. Um, so part of what I've already emphasized are these important questions, but they're also hard questions. And to answer hard questions, what you often need are different skill and knowledge sets, uh, multiple skill and knowledge sets. And one person does not have all of that. You need a group of people. Um, so for example, here I could tell you about um, a CIE working group, which was um, thinking about uh, the evolution of range expansion. And the experimental biologists had done these experiments and they got really contradictory results, things that didn't make sense in terms of the theory. So we put them together with a group of mathematical modelers um, to try to uh, get those two different skill sets to figure out what was going on. Um, another ingredient of the method is that you can get new insights from diverse perspectives. Here I could tell you about a CIE working group which was looking at the collapse of the fisheries off the east coast of Canada, normally taken from a population biology uh, point of view. But in this case, they brought in people who worked with functional traits and that combination was uh, unique um, in creating a new perspective. Serendipity. Serendipity, you can, you can uh, not plan for serendipity, but you can create the right circumstances for it. So you need to make time and space for this type of intensive collaboration. And the final point is very pragmatic. With so many people, you can actually achieve a lot in a short amount of time. So for example, here's a quote from uh, Canadian evolutionary biologist, Andrew Henry, who says, um, complex problems in ecology and evolution require multiple types of expertise. Synthesis groups are outstanding way to get together people with different backgrounds and skills to solve shared problems. Another reason working groups are effective is because of the goals that they set themselves. So for example, uh, the goals are to answer big questions. So some of those big questions could be, what is the overall pattern? What principles are generally true? Those are questions that you might answer with meta-analyses, data syntheses, um, and reviews. So for example, uh, most of the big uh, meta-analyses of biodiversity ecosystem function research have come from working groups. A second set of ideas could be, there's a lot of ideas out there. How do they all fit together? How do we integrate them? And to answer that, you might develop uh, frameworks or models. Uh, and there I could point to um, a CIA working group who really set uh, the, the framework for how we model the effect of temperature on trophic interactions. Um, third uh, kind of questions would be, where are we going? What's the next best idea? Uh, this might be a perspective type uh, um, product that you're creating. For, for example, uh, some of you may uh, work on meta communities. The idea of meta communities came from um, a working group. Finally, you could ask, how do we apply science to this problem? Um, and what do the users of science actually need to know in our order to solve this problem? So this can result in like action plans or white papers. And um, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I'm so excited about Symbiose is uh, its focus on uh, this type of um, outcome. Here's a quote from uh, Mark Belland, um, a community ecologist in Canada who says, I synthesize to help ensure that individual research projects become more than the sum of their parts, to generate insights achievable no other way, and to help the scientific community, including myself, add depth and breadth to our perspective on big topics of the day. So why should you take part in a working group? Um, I hope I'm starting to make the case that it allows you to step back from you know, your, your focus on the day-to-day -day science and to really think big picture. Um, it allows you to be exposed to new ideas outside uh, your discipline or your university. Um, it allows uh, new collaborations to form and it uh, can result in some really high impact science. Here's a quote from Mary O'Connor, um, 
uh, community colleges uh, in Canada and the uh, associate or the deputy director of uh, the CIE. Mary says, through CIE, I am able to work with people who challenge my thinking. And together we come up with new insights and discoveries. I find synthesis to be one of the most challenging and fulfilling ways of doing science. So I'd like to emphasize that um, scientists themselves benefit from being part of working groups. Um, and I like to make that point because you may think that, well, you're, st you're stepping into, you're stepping away from a more competitive uh, individual lab-based way of doing science into a more collaborative way of doing science. That doesn't mean that it won't benefit your career. It will actually really benefit your career. Um, so here's some uh, data that uh, from an in, in prep publication um, at CIE where we looked at uh, um, the citations per year uh, in different types of publications. When they originated from working groups, we uh, the publications are cited about five times more than other types of publications. Uh, participants. Uh, in, in working groups um, get a bump in their H index following working groups for about five years or so. Um, participants also report uh, future benefits of being in a working group, not just publications and so on, but the particularly the development of new collaborators, but also uh, new funding opportunities and the development of valuable uh, databases. So I would like to, um, uh, illustrate uh, some of the last future uh, uh, future um, benefits points uh, with my own experience. So here I'm stepping back a little bit uh, from my role as CIA director and uh, putting on more uh, my researcher uh, hat. Um, so uh, in this particular quote, I'm saying I synthesized to understand which ecological principles apply broadly, which are system specific and why. So this is really something that I have thought a lot about in um, the research that I, my students and my collaborators do on the aquatic insects within bromeliads. And uh, this particular photo was actually taken um, in uh, Rastinga uh, near Makae, uh, where I first started collaborating uh, with uh, other Brazilian, with Brazilian researchers. And that collaboration um, resulted in us forming uh, a network called the Brominad Working Group in 2011. Um, the first working group meeting, uh, I, I uh, got funding from my university to start it. Uh, it was a working group meeting, uh, very much like the one I outlined in the cartoon, five days long, uh, breakout groups and all that. Um, and from that meeting, we designed two uh, experiments that we conducted um, throughout uh, uh, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. We also applied for grants for lab exchanges between Canada and Brazil. Um, and we developed um, an Excel database um, of all our survey data of invertebrates and bromeliads. Well, one of those global experiments was uh, so big and complex and involved that we decided we need another working group uh, to analyze the data together. Um, so uh, we got funding from uh, research agencies in Canada and Brazil for a working group in 2015, uh, which occurred in Parache. You could, that is the photo that you see there. Uh, and not only did that result in a lot of uh, uh, publications, uh, but um, at that point, uh, we got so much momentum that we realized we needed to formalize this Excel database in the form of a relational database online. Well, that gave us the digital infrastructure that allowed us to, to apply for funding from CESAB. CESAB is a census center um, in France, uh, very much like uh, CIE or Symbiose. Um, so we were funded for five working group meetings that met in France uh, over several years. Um, not only did we get a lot of uh, science done then, but we also had money for a postdoc, which allowed us to develop an R package uh, that could uh, effectively um, uh, query and synthesize this online database 
uh, we also developed uh, functional traits for all of our invertebrates. So with this growing digital uh, competence, uh, we then uh, were able to apply successfully for funding for another working group uh, from ESTIF, uh, which is the German uh, Synthesis Center. So we had three meetings in Germany. Um, and as part of that funding, we were able to develop a second R package and develop a living algorithm uh, for the food webs. Um, and we are now in the process of using that infrastructure to apply for um, another working group. So I hope that uh, example shows you um, um, uh, how a working group can fit in uh, to the trajectory of your um, career. And um, you know, I would like to end with a final point, which is all of this is not just great science, but it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, I have grown so much as a scientist, but also as a human being um, through um, all of these uh, wonderful collaborations um, over the years. Um, you know, I know we are in the time of COVID and, uh, you know, things are just not as much fun as they used to be in general. Um, but I, you know, I hope uh, we get a chance in the uh, um, Q&A session um, to talk about how we can still do get capture some of this magic um, in virtual working groups or in uh, combinations of in-person and virtual working groups. We call them hybrid. Uh, uh, working groups um, that can recapture uh, some of this uh, synergy. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Diane, to explain so clearly and briefly what is uh, the science of synthesis, the dynamic of working group, why they are effective and why do we need to take part of them. And I think it's really important to to understand that working group can re really be good for the career of young scientists and opportunity to collaboration and to have fun also. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Um, now, uh, our second uh, speaker is Benjamin Ben Hopper, uh, who is the director of the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, GNCs and professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, US. Ben works on marine ecology, uh, the interface between ecology and human dynamics with the aim of informing and facilitating conservation and resource management efforts in marine systems. Thank you, Ben, for being with us. And the floor is yours now, thanks. Thank you so much. I'm Paul and everyone for, for joining today. Uh, and Diane, thanks for that fantastic uh, setup for what synthesis is and can be. I, I'm going to take the next 20 minutes or so to talk about two different projects that we worked on here at NCES, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, where I sit and I'm the director, um, that have looked at the past 25 years of synthesis and ecology and environmental science and what that tells us about the, the role that synthesis can play in both understanding our systems and advancing knowledge. And then a sneak preview of some work that's underway right now um, about priorities for the future of synthesis and ecology and environmental science in the next uh, decade or so. So I hope with that, it'll help set a context of how we can use synthesis to really advance understanding and uh, solutions for our planet. Okay. Um, so this is a paper uh, that just came out about a year ago that we uh, collectively looked at how e uh, ecological synthesis has helped us advance our, our knowledge in our disciplines. And to do this, um, we wanted to compare the role of synthesis papers to um, non-synthesis papers in the field of ecology and what that has done in terms of their impact and their uh, shift in the focus of the research that has happened in the last 25 years. So uh, since NCES has been around since 1995, we use the publications from our synthesis center as an example, not the only synthesis papers, but an example set 
of synthesis papers that we could then compare to the broader set of literature that we could draw from across all of ecology. So we looked at the 22 years from 1997 to, to 2018. We had nearly 6,000 papers from NCES over that time period. Um, about 2,300 of them came from working groups. We excluded the many that are from postdocs, just because postdocs uh, can have publications from prior to their time at NCES that they list NCES as an affiliation, but didn't really emerge from their work at NCES. So we wanted to isolate those that came from working groups. And then we looked at the key words from all these papers to help find similar papers in the broader corpus of all literature that we could compare to. So we were trying to compare as closely as possible similar types of research to understand the role of synthesis versus non-synthesis. And of the nearly 900,000 papers that have been published in ecology in the last 25 years, about 320,000 of those matched um, their keywords to those from this set of papers from NCES. So these were our two comparisons, these 2,300 papers from NCES and these 320,000 papers from the broader set of literature. And then just uh, to try to help inf uh, isolate those that have had kind of the biggest impact on the field, we filtered out papers that um, didn't uh, that were below the median citation rate of about five citations per year. So we wanted to focus on the highly cited ones just to understand those that are having the greatest influence on our field. How do we compare um, synthesis papers to non-synthesis papers? So what you see in the plot here um, are the clusters of keywords. Those are the gray um, words that are strung together that are um, a collection of papers that um, match those keywords. And um, what you can see is that the, um, the, there's a much, all the dots above that uh, diagonal line are where synthesis papers are having a higher uh, citation rate than non-synthesis papers. And, so, and you can also see the percent of papers in any particular topic area that are synthesis papers. So those that are further along the right so food webs, biodiversity, and ecosystem function have had a lot of attention from synthesis, whereas some of the ones like risk assessment, heavy metals, and pollution have not had much uh, focus in synthesis. So you can see how often they're addressed, and you can see that on par, as Diane pointed out as well, you get much higher citation rates for papers that are, are synthesis papers. And actually, we found a remarkably similar result of about five times higher citation rates for synthesis papers. And then we looked at the change over time of where key papers emerged and how much influence they were having. So the, the y-axis here is the, the z-score, basically a, a standard deviation against the mean of the impact or the citation rate of key papers. And so the as they get higher up, um, papers in the synthesis topic um, we're having a really big influence on the field. And from this, we can see how um, synthesis papers often launch entire areas of research. This is a very famous paper from um, Robert Costanza and colleagues. It was one of the very first working groups at NCES that looked at a global valuation of ecosystem services. It was very controversial, but very influential and spawned an entire uh, subdiscipline of research around ecosystem service valuation. We have another one um, from the early years of NCS for Oswald Sala and his colleagues that forecast the impact of climate change or the change of global biodiversity under climate change. And again, really helped catapult a lot of research and understanding how climate change would be affecting biodiversity. We also have examples of papers that came in the middle of, of a research uh, trajectory that helped pivot or change the direction of it because of the really important role it played in our understanding. And so in this case, Elif et al. in 2006 made a really uh, key improvement in the methodology for doing species distribution models that opened up whole new pathways of research for understanding ecological processes and ecological change. And there are other examples scattered through here where actually synthesis can help resolve de debates by bringing together disparate data and kind of answering questions that 
are have long been debated and through synthesis can be can re be resolved. So it's a really powerful tool in many paths along the process of research. We were also looking at um, how diverse synthesis is relative to non-synthesis. So this is a way of thinking about how um, how many types of keywords exist within those clusters of research compared to papers that are non-synthesis. So basically, we have this cluster archetype, cluster bridging, and cluster diversity that are different metrics of how much papers draw on different types of ideas or data when doing the work. And basically, in all cases, but definitely in this diversity across keywords, uh, and diversity within and across keywords, we see that synthesis papers are much more um, diverse, really. And that's not surprising because synthesis by design, as Diane pointed out to you, brings together different people, different data, different perspectives. And together that makes for a, a much more diverse set of ideas that are brought to bear on the research. And this is just a nice visualization of how these papers cluster. So you can see the colors are these clusters of papers across keywords. And then all those lines are the way that papers are connected to each other through shared keywords. And it's a really wonderful visualization of how interconnected and diverse synthesis can be and how that, that interconnection and diversity really builds a lot of insight by bringing together different data and people to answer questions. So now I want to shift to the second half of this talk that is looking at priorities for synthesis in ecology and environmental science. And this work comes from a, a workshop that we hosted at NCS in February of this year, virtually, um, to get together people across many, many different sub-disciplines to um, come together to uh, think about what are the key priorities for the coming decade or so that are really important for synthesis to tackle. And I want to talk a little bit about the process that we used because it was deliberately done to be as diverse and inclusive as possible uh, for coming up with this list of ideas. So originally it was constrained to just participants from the United States because the funding came from our National Science Foundation. But because we shifted to a virtual setting, we could invite people from around the world, uh, which is what you see on the right. So it's dominated by people from the United States because of how the funding originally started. But we were able to bring in people from a dozen or so countries virtually from around the world. And uh, a little bit more uh, women than men, but about equal. And as expected, mostly from academia, but people from uh, nonprofit non-governmental organizations, people from for-profit businesses, government agencies, and, and other sectors. So um, a nice mix of people and affiliations brought to bear in the, in the workshop. Our field of ecology and environmental science, especially in the United States, is not yet as diverse as we would like it to be. Um, but the representation in this group fa fairly well matches that uh, diversity within our field. So this is just a breakdown of the, of the people as they self-reported um, of where, what their ethnicity is. So what we did before the workshop, we asked um, participants, what are the most pressing questions in ecology and environmental science and how can synthesis help advance these questions? And then we had virtual um, brainstorming sessions with smaller groups of people to flesh out ideas um, and develop questions that they could put forward into a consolidated list. And then we opened up that list uh, in a virtual open forum that people could add additional questions to and then upvote the ones that they felt were most important. And in, so we, we ended up with 323 questions, but through the upvoting process, we took the top 30 and um, consolidated and categorized those into themes that we could use to then dive deeper into understanding how we could tackle those um, top questions and where the potential hurdles might lie. So I'll go into each of these in a, in a minute, but we had seven general priority topics. Those are in the blue. And then a lot of discussion about the process of synthesis and what it needs to be in the future. And those are the two in the red, and I'll talk about those as well. 
we're in the middle of drafting the manuscript for this in a, a truly inclusive way. So with 125 co-authors that are deeply engaged in the writing and editing process, which is definitely challenging as you can imagine, um, but really enriching in the experience of bringing so many voices to bear on what um, emerges in the paper and, and how it's represented for our, from our discussions and presented to the world through, the, to, through this manuscript. So we are drafting it, revising it, revising it again, and we're nearly at the final version which we will submit shortly. Okay. I'll be brief on this, but I want to give you a, a little bit of a sense of the, the priority topics. So the first one, uh, we use this acronym in, in uh, English anyway for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, so JEDI. And this is a process part of, of synthesis, which I'll get to in a minute, but it's also increasingly becoming an important topic of research that uh, informs our understanding of how uh, ecosystems work uh, through the interaction of people and the inequity or environmental injustices that influence how the systems work. So questions that were raised in this topic are things like, um, how are ecological processes affected by equity aspects of resource management? Or do affluence and poverty in human societies have different spatial temporal impacts on ecosystem services? So it's really trying to understand the intersection of environmental justice and equity and ecology and environmental science. The second, second topic is around um, human and natural systems. This is the connection of these two systems. This is not uh, a new topic. Obviously, people have been addressing this question for at least a decade now or longer, but there's a key role that synthesis can play in advancing and better understanding the interactions between these two systems. So questions in this topic were things like, do human ecosystem relationships differ between terrestrial and marine systems? And can we characterize the different relationships in a systematic way between different systems? Or how do we disentangle human and non-human impacts on the environment? Or do we come to different understandings of ecological system function with different characterizations of humans' positive or negative roles? The third topic is related but different is really focused on applied and use-inspired science. So this is the idea that um, questions that we ask are particularly relevant and interesting when they are informed by the kinds of decisions that need to be made using that scientific information. So questions in this topic include things like, how do we understand the balance of mitigation versus adaptation in terms of ecological impacts and human well-being outcomes? Or how are individual species responding to climate change in terms of different traits and consequences for species interactions? Or finally, what are the best nature-based approaches to mitigation? The fourth topic um, is what we're calling generality. So this is obviously something that's been at the core of ecology for, for decades. It's um, the idea that ecology is trying to be a more predictive science at understanding the rules that govern our systems and what can we say is sort of universal across different systems and what is instead a more specific to the context or the place that is being studied. So questions in this topic include um, things like, can we gain a mechanistic understanding um, for across most species or systems? And how far can we get with generalizations based on species traits? Or interestingly, what do we learn from being wrong? And then uh, what are promising avenues for including increasing amounts of ecological complexity in predictions? Fifth um, topic is also one that has been long addressed in ecology, but has a special place for synthesis and helping us better understand it, is the role of scale in driving ecological processes. And in fact, this is one of the, the central places that uh, synthesis can play a key role because you have to think across 
um, the scales and data across these scales to find um, pattern. And that's what synthesis is so great at doing. So questions in this topic include, how can we scale up rapid microscale processes that directly affect macro processes? Or how does scale affect the conclusions of ecological studies? Or how does knowledge of local scale ecology impact our ability to synthesize the larger spatial scales with diverse data? Sixth is uh, what we're calling system design and resilience or the complexity of ecosystems and their resilience. Again, this is a great topic for synthesis and addresses questions like how does system integration or structure and dynamics inform uh, uh, our understanding of resilience? Or are there early warning signs such as increasing variance that may indicate a lack of resilience? Again, these are ripe for synthesis because you really need to integrate across data and disciplines to understand these complexity of the system dynamics. And then the last topic is predictability. Uh, obviously, ecology has long sought to be a predictive science, but this is more about near-term predictability akin to what we do with weather or finance, where we use a lot of information to say what's going to happen next month or next quarter or maybe next year. And questions in this area address things like, uh, should we forecast, can we forecast, and how best do we forecast um, ecological systems? Or how much does the current state control or constrain the future? Or how do we predict rare events? These are all parts of what synthesis can do so well. And I want to end just briefly on these two um, priority topics, uh, sorry, priority issues about the process of how synthesis is done. And this was a dominant uh, theme of the workshop conversations, uh, probably equally as much as the actual focus or topics of synthesis is how it can and should be done. And there are really two things about this that are key. One is expanding the participation. It was clear that we need more voices, more perspectives, more types of people, more ways of understanding um, how systems work to help create a better understanding of our world and a more accurate synthesis of how these ecosystems work. So we really need to increase the diversity and inclusion of people engaged in synthesis. And then related, uh, we really need to expand the kinds of data and knowledge that are brought to bear on synthesis. Historically, we've used uh, open publicly available data or those that have been published in peer review literature but there's a much richer set of information out there, knowledge, ways of understanding that um, synthesis needs to begin to incorporate to really get a better understanding of how systems work. So diversity of people and diversity of knowledge and information will really help synthesis move forward in the next decade to be much uh, richer and much more accurate to, to the research that it's doing. So I hope I've given you a, a very brief tour of our perspective on where we've come in the last 25 years with synthesis and how it can really influence our understanding and the impact that we're having with our science and where I think some really exciting opportunities for synthesis lie in the next decade and beyond. Um, and I'm excited for the conversations we'll have through question and answer. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ben, for the exciting presentation, showing the amazing impact of NC's papers, and also uh, it's great to see these future topics and approaches uh, for synthesis in, in the future. So we, we do have already some questions. Uh, I think we have six questions. I will take the privilege to be the moderator to, to make the first uh, question. And I will also, um, I will begin by the more broad questions and then go into the details. So uh, as a first question, that is both for you, Ben, and for Diane, um, the synthesis science is now more than 25 years old. So NC has 25 years. And uh, this kind of science has been developed essentially and led essentially by researcher from the Northern Hemisphere. And what is, in your opinions, the challenges and potentials to, to, to develop this approach in southern countries and particularly on biodiversity country? So I really would like to hear both of you about this. 
And I think we, we have a very general uh, question is uh, from anonymous uh, person. Could you clarify what is the difference between review and synthesis? And I think this kind of mistake is done frequently in, in proposal that we, we, we saw in, in symbiosis and now also in the joint call with, with CESAP. So it would be nice to, to, to answer this general question also. So please, Ben or Diane, uh, as you wish. Who, who goes first? I'll, I'll jump in, but I really <laughs> welcome Diane's uh, thoughts as well. Um, to the second question, I mean, review can be a type of synthesis uh, because synthesis can be of, of data or it can be of ideas or tools. Um, and so the synthesis of ideas um, can be done through a review paper. There are more quantitative approaches to synthesis like meta-analysis or analytical approaches that are probably what a lot of people think of, of synthesis. And that is at the core of a lot of what synthesis research has been. Um, I think it's less important the distinction between review and synthesis and more the idea that synthesis is really intended to be a, a broad umbrella of the way of bringing together people, ideas, data, knowledge, tools, disciplines to help address um, really interesting questions. So the first part, um, yes, it is a shame and unacceptable uh, how uh, dominant the Northern Hemisphere has been in science, and certainly that's represented in synthesis science as well. I haven't really, I have no information to back this up, but I hope that synthesis has been better at this than other types of science because of its goal of bringing together people. And at least at NCS, and I think at a lot of the other synthesis centers, we've put a priority on bringing in um, new people from different parts of the world. We have a map up on our wall with pins of where people have come from in different countries to really help celebrate that diversity. And I know we can do better, but um, it is certainly a strength of synthesis. To, and it's wonderful to have Symbiose on the map now as another sister synthesis center in the world to help um, partly fill that gap but uh, thinking about ways that our synthesis centers can work together to help bring together people across the north-south divide uh, is very exciting and, and very much needed. Diane? Questions? Um, so in terms of the north-south divide, I would say it, <clears throat> It has been largely a top-down issue in terms of, um, you know, the uh, the funding for census centers. So Symbiose is like rectifying that uh, that issue. So um, the reason, you know, you can create a working group in many ways. I kind of explained like my own history through working groups, where a lot of it started off self-funded by research grants and universities. Um, but it's a lot easier to apply to a synthesis center for funding for a working group. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so there have not been uh, synthesis centers, unfortunately, uh, located in um, a lot of uh, countries in the South. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's slowly being rectified. Um, and I think as, uh, you know, uh, people get more and more experience with these and kind of realize like how powerful a way of working they are, then kind of um, word spreads on the street, right? Uh, there becomes more and more demand for uh, uh, creation of working groups. Um, in terms of the review versus synthesis, I think Ben addressed it, but I usually think of synthesis as being um, all these different activities. One might be a structured review, but, uh, or, or a meta-analysis, but that's just kind of one, that's like, in my list of questions, that was the first question. After that, it's like, uh, where's the field going? That's not a review. That's like uh, a creation of a new research paradigm, for example. Um, it, and it's also, uh, you know, you could create a whole new theoretical model. Um, you know, that's not a review. <laughs> that's, that's a whole new thing, right? Um, so yes. And data syntheses are not reviews there. They're data syntheses. Thank you, Diane. 
I, I will join uh, three questions now. The first one, we have the same uh, subject. The first one is from Nayara Tabanis. Um, how to ensure that new members of the working groups are included and participating, uh, contributing to the individual or collective, collective goals from the advisor point of view. I, I think this is related to the Katarina Jagovac, who is a postdoc in a working group, in symbiotic working group. And she's asking how to keep the entire work, working group active and productive. And what are the key suggestions for keeping engagement over time? And I want also to, uh, to include the question from Patricia Ruggiero, who is a postdoc. Uh, how crucial and frequent does working group benefit or in fact need a specific professional non-scientists to take care and develop the process of generating those syntheses? I, I think those questions are related to the dynamic uh, of the working group and you do have a lot of experience. Yes, so um, there is an art to um, being in a working group and running a working group and participating in a working group. Um, so, um, you know, the first step is who you invite. So you don't invite big egos to working groups. Um, that is the death of a working group. If you have one person who dominates the conversation, um, who is inflexible in their point of view. Uh, instead, you invite people that you feel are open to new ideas and can listen as well as contribute. Um, the next ingredient is setting um, the tone of an inclusive collaborative experience. Um, so uh, there's various things you can do there. For example, uh, you can establish roles that you rotate through the participants. So perhaps the facilitator role, uh, somebody facilitates one day, but then somebody else facilitates the next day. And that really shakes things up and ensures you get new points of view. Um, often working groups uh, like to take notes um, during these meetings. Uh, in, so you can collaboratively take notes on Google Docs and you can have the main note taker, that person can rotate as well. Um, you can have rules where, okay, um, every now and then you stop and you, you really reach out to people who have not yet contributed their ideas and, you know, basically get the people who are very enthusiastic about talking to maybe um, listen for a little bit. Um, so these are all part of like ensuring that, you know, that the whole point of a working group is the synergy between the participants. And if you don't have an inclusive um, environment, um, this is not gonna happen. That's all spot on and fantastic advice. I would just add that um, we've actually engaged um, outside facilitators, especially for the first meeting of a group uh, where the group is building trust and understanding because by design many of the people have not met each other or worked together before and that's also the magic of it but it, it requires some curation of that um, interaction to make sure that you build that understanding and trust and working relationship and a facilitator can do that really well and set uh, the tone for a lot of what Diane was saying about how to make sure there's not one senior person that never takes notes and just sits back and reigns over the group while all the young scientists are the ones having to do all the, the hard work. So it's, it's designed, the facilitation helps really set that tone. And then you've learned how to do it because as Diane said, it is an art and it takes some practice, but having someone help you, and then we provide a lot of guidance too, then the following meetings can, can work much better. So, so then do, do you have this facilitator for all working group at the beginning, at least for the first meeting? We don't do it for all of them, but for many of them. Uh, some groups, it's the, the 
PIs who have proposed the group have a lot of experience with working groups, or we know the members of the group and, and they just, they say they don't need it and we trust that. Others, it's clear they, they definitely will benefit from a facilitator and then we, we offer that and support that. Great. Nice. And um, now we have a question from Cecilia Andreazzi, uh, who is co-leading a symbiosis working group also. And she, it's more a comment that uh, they are missing also the magic of the working group, the uh, the face-to-face -face meeting. And I, I, I think it could be nice to comment, uh, maybe Diane, uh, about the hybrid idea. So at least uh, once we still not, do not have the possibility to, to have this in-person meeting. Uh, so how we can uh, uh, improve the meetings and the magic of the working groups with the hybrid options. Sure, um, and these are um, ideas that um, a group of the um, directors of um, some of the census centers around the world recently published in a Nature, Ecology and Evolution paper, um, which uh, is called Maintaining Momentum, um, if you wish to look for it. Um, so basically, the pandemic has created two challenges um, for working groups. Uh, one is um, the need for or, or the difficulty in face-to-face uh, -face meetings, uh, the need for vaccinations, mass social distancing. Um, and the second one is the issues with travel, uh, particularly international travel. Um, so if we, if you are in a situation where the first of these challenges has been mitigated somewhat, uh, perhaps everybody is uh, fully vaccinated in, in who might meet together um, and you have other precautions in place, um, yet you still have international travel. You could think about a hybrid working group. So here's the idea. Um, uh, a small group of people who are in the same geographic region, get together for an in-person meeting. Simultaneously, that occurs in different parts, either of the country or of the world. Um, and then those groups uh, coordinate virtually. Um, so uh, this actually can work uh, fairly effectively, even with different time zones, uh, because what you can do is, um, what Ben's called a work re relay, where um, you know one group does one task, and then basically at the end of their day, they pass it over to the other group in the other country who uh, starts work on it. Um, you know, uh, even before the pandemic, I participated in a really effective use of of that method. Um, so that would be like a spatial hybrid. Um, you can also have hybrids uh, um, through time. So I think actually. Um, a really nice example of that is what Ben just presented in terms of like um, having, uh, you know, a really big group of people who met virtually um, and brainstormed about all these questions, um, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, it could be, uh, you know, that didn't happen in this case, but it could be that then you take um, that idea for a working group and then you run an in-person working group based around it. Um, and then you know, maybe you have a few meetings and in between the meetings, you keep in contact, you keep the momentum going by virtual meetings in between the in-person meetings. So that would be a temporal hybrid where through time, you kind of alternate in-person and, and video and in-person and video. Thanks, Diane. Um, just a correction, uh, I said that Katarina uh, was a postdoc, but she was, she's the co-PI of the working group. Well, now we do have more applied questions. Uh, I will group, group them. So Rafael Chavez is asking if you do have practical examples of policies that directly use the outcome from uh, the synthesis process presented today. I think this is uh, related also to the question from Thomas Levinson, um, where he asking um, 
uh, if there are any metrics that show that metrics or evidence that shows that they are also more that synthesis dynamics are more effective in affecting public policy, global proposals, application in general. So, so metrics or evidence of uh, applied uh, outcomes of synthesis group. And Paulo Drummond is asking how to make the synthesis topic more policy relevant. So all questions relate to the application and maybe to the co-construction of policies and so on. Yeah, it's a great set of questions. And um, in fact, I think synthesis is um, particularly well suited for informing policy and management decisions because it is trying to synthesize across lots of data and disciplines and, and ideas, which is what you need to inform management, at least at a, at a, a general scale. Like if you wanna know how to manage particular species in a particular place, given the particular context of what's happening there, maybe synthesis has a less useful role, although it's still important. But when you start to say like, how do we manage species under climate change? What is the effect of small versus large protected areas for biodiversity on and on? These are the questions that are perfect for synthesis and is what management and policy needs. And also just the bringing together of social, economic and natural sciences and humanities even are what sits at the core of effective management. You have to bring those disciplines together to really design effective management. And that's what synthesis does. So there's lots and lots of examples of this across all the synthesis centers, uh, I, literally hundreds. At NCS, I can speak to just a few examples. In the early days of NCS, there was a, a working group on synth synthesizing across the science of marine protected areas. And that work produced like 25 different publications, which was great for science, but it also came out with a consensus statement about what is known about the science of marine protected areas that led directly to the creation of the network of marine protected areas on the Channel Islands off the coast of Southern California here in Santa Barbara, ultimately the whole network of marine protected areas in California and really influenced the design and implementation of marine protected areas around the world from that that one work group. Um, there's also an initiative that, that NCS was part of for the last seven years called the Science for Nature and People Partnership or SNAP, which is a partnership between NCS, the Nature Conservancy and Wildlife Conservation Society. And the central idea behind that is that to really make sure that synthesis is helping develop realistic and meaningful solutions for conservation and management is you need to co-develop the questions and co-execute the research, which is exactly what was brought up in one of these questions. So this isn't about academics and their ivory towers saying, this is the idea that people need. If we just give it to them, we will solve the world's problems. And then all the people on the ground are like, that's not what we need. We need this other question answered. So by bringing them in as partners, often co-PIs, but certainly co-members of the working group where they help develop the questions that need to be asked and do the research to address them, by the time you get to the end, it is the set of information that is needed for the managers or the conservationists to use. And that really helps and accelerate the, or certainly increase the chance that it'll be relevant and used for policy and management. So this, that's a long answer, but I actually, I hope it gives some texture to why I actually think it's exactly what synthesis should be and can be. Thank you, Ben. Ben, do, do you want to, to compliment or? Um, I don't know if I can improve on that very excellent answer, um, but I maybe I'll just remind you, um, if we kind of uh, think in, of synthesis in general and all the different ways it's done, um, you know, there's probably no better example than the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is essentially a synthesis group, right? Um, it's kind of like a meta working group. They've got many working groups uh, that are under one umbrella. Um, it, 
you know, that, that, that has been uh, enormously uh, effective. Um, I don't have any about the metrics. Um, that's a great question. Um, you should go ahead and, and, and sort that out. Um, I don't know of any metrics. Um, I guess in terms of, uh, um, you know, working uh, with users of science, um, you know, one effective thing that we've been starting at the CIE is we have um, kind of a, a sub part of CIE that we call the Living Data Project, where we um, train graduate students on how to um, uh, manage uh, data and then uh, team them up with uh, partner organizations that have like legacy data sets that need rescuing. Um, and then as part of that, we turn around and we talk to the partner organizations. It's like, okay, now that you've, we've rescued these really important data sets and they're in beautiful form, like, um, well, you needed them for a reason, right? So like, let's uh, extract all the knowledge uh, from them. So then we get, you know, we approach the partners to, to uh, formulate the working group questions um, that we then go off and answer. So that can also be an effective way. Thank you, Diane. Um, now we do have about the, the questions about the data set. So we have <clears throat> Unildo Marini question. How do you measure the importance of standardized long-term monitoring data for ecological synthesis? And also the question from Deborah Drucker about uh, and the availability of data that follow the fair and care principles. Um, she's saying that it, it is crucial for synthesis science. So how do you see the evolution of the field of eco-informatics or environmental data science? And what is your data vision for the next decade? Diane, you want to go first? Sure. Um... So when census centers started, um, you know, I think uh, uh, it took a while, but then came fairly quickly the, re the recognition that you can't have census without a really strong um, leadership approach to data. Um, and so census centers and um, uh, open data and data toolkits have all kind of uh, been intertwined from fairly early on. Um, so in terms of long-term data, oh, well, how do you measure the importance? I, I, I need to make like some kind of like infinity symbol here. Um, they're extraordinarily important. Um, so a lot of census is done uh, in terms of data census. And for that, you do need these uh, massive data sets. Um, and so um, anything that uh, promotes um, open data, so the FAIR principles were uh, measured, so I um, can't remember the entire acronym, but it's findable and accessible and uh, interoperable and reproducible, I think. Um, uh, so um, anything that uh, we can do to promote that type of data sharing culture um, is essential for synthesis science, as is the development of the appropriate tools for archiving data, managing data, and compiling and working with data. So the data science revolution is um, critical here. And I feel that you know, census centers have to take a leadership role here, um, you know, given the importance of data to the entire census enterprise. Um, so we uh, need to be training uh, people at every level in their career from graduate students through postdocs to, through, through faculty in all of this. And we need to um, support our institutions in devising appropriate uh, data um, policies. I think that's great. I, I would just amplify that um, synthesis and the idea of fair data have been coupled from almost day one because you have to 
be able to find and use data to do synthesis. So uh, if you, the community of synthesis scientists have long been advocates of the FAIR principles. I think CARE is, is maybe the next generation for synthesis. And I, I alluded to that a little bit in the, the comments I gave through my talk, but um, how we bring together different types of knowledge and understanding and information into synthesis is critical. It's not yet sufficient, but it has some challenges around um, data ethics and um, what it means to be open and reproducible when not all data is or information or knowledge is meant to be that way. And so I think it's a really interesting an important challenge for synthesis in the next decade to wrestle with that and figure out how we can do more inclusive synthesis while still adhering to fair principles and 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 doing the best we can with the care principles so it's a it's a fantastic question um and something we're thinking a lot about and there aren't yet easy answers by any means but it's something that really needs a lot of attention Great, thank you. So now we have three questions related to gene composition. So the first one is from Giselle Wink. Wink. How would you deal with the big ego in, in your working group? Uh, it was somewhat challenging during presidential meeting, but this challenging increased a lot on the virtual ones. Um, also, the question from Eduarda Romanini. Uh, thank you all. I still do not exactly understand how the working group is formed. So to be part of a working group, the persons need to be invited or people interested in the team, in the team may try to participate. I think that Steve had this option that you, you can invite yourself. And after a working group is formed, a new member can join the group through the war throughout the work. And also Marisa Mamedi uh, from CNPq is asking about working group formation composition. Um, and she's asking, have you have your synthesis centers ever promote any sort of matchmaking event or opportunity? So a platform, for example, to do this uh, matchmaking. In other words, how to, to network the synthesis scientist community. Who wants to begin? Um, I'll, I'll say a few thoughts, but I know Diane has a lot of, of wisdom to offer there too. Um, we have long been very deliberate about um, composition of working groups that it is both proposed and curated. So the, the people who are putting together a proposal for a working group propose who they want in the group and we ask them to leave some spots empty. So they say what the, the discipline or expertise that is needed um, for that spot, or at least um, a collection of names. And then we work with the PIs to help make sure that the group um, is diverse, is uh, appropriate. Uh, and uh, if there are some members we know are from past experience are not good players uh, in the working group, we encourage them to shift the composition. So it's not a situation where you get to just propose and, and run with it. It's we try to help curate that. Um, that said, because we are trying to bring in new people all the time, we, we don't know most of the people that are being proposed. And so um, we can't ensure that you won't have a big ego emerge in the group. And for that, we uh, the facilitation helps. We have a lot of guidance on how to run an effective group uh, that people can use to help manage that. And then we have a code of conduct that we've instituted recently that provides a mechanism for people to report um, uh, inappropriate behavior. Of course, having a big ego is inappropriate and, and lastly, express it in a way that is, um, you know, unkind to people and, and we have ways of say you know interventions when that happens but it's not perfect um but through all of these mechanisms we try to mitigate that as much as possible in terms of people uh getting involved who aren't invited you're right i mean the way it's it's proposed people 
you know, choose who they want to work with. Uh, and we curate that, but we don't know the global community of all possible people out there. And so um, we do occasionally try to like through workshops, like I was describing this, um, the future of synthesis workshop, create an opportunity for people to come together and meet each other. And that can help generate ideas and, and relationships that can then result in working group proposals. Um, but in the end, it's an imperfect process of how we um, get more people involved. We're working hard to try to be as inclusive as possible, but I would say, don't be shy about reaching out. Um, I've often, when I was a graduate student and postdoc, uh, just emailed when I saw that a, a working group had been funded at, uh, at NCS or one of the other centers, I just wrote the PIs and said, hey, I'm really interested in this topic. Here's my background. Would you be interested in me? Uh, and it didn't always work, but sometimes it did, you know? And I, so I think just be uh, bold and you might get the occasional no, but you also might get the occasional yes. Um, so about that big ego, it's kind of like uh, the same skill set that you use when you've got um, that kid in your class who's always answering the questions and putting up their hand, which, you know, is nice at the beginning of your course, but then after a while you're like, you know, shut up already, let somebody else answer. Um, so there's different ways to do it. Um, uh, Ben's going over some of them. Um, you know, you kind of needs a forceful role for the facilitator of like, um, you know, uh, sort of saying, well, we've heard from so-and-so, let's have some other points of view, um, that sort of thing. Let's, uh, you know, uh, this is a point in our discussion where we'd like to hear, like if you have not yet spoken, um, you know, this is your floor time. We'd like to hear all the ideas out there. Um, you know, if it gets really bad, it's time to break everybody up into small groups. Um, so the question I think was also like, it get, or the observation this might get, the big ego problem gets worse uh, in virtual settings perhaps. Um, we all know the, the person on Zoom who like never mutes their screen, right? Who's always jumping in with something to say. Um, you might have to just break it up into small little breakout groups and then get each breakout group to report back. I mean, if you've got four breakout groups, Big Ego only gets a quarter of the speaking time, right? Um, well, those are some things. Um, I guess some of the other uh, points, questions, um, kind of got to the, uh, idea of um, equity or access to working groups, which is something that I've been quite concerned about since I became director. Um, you know, we, you don't want to have it just uh, uh, networks of people who know each other uh, through other work ways or who get invited by their high profile supervisor to take part, for example. Um, so, one thing we've done, and, and NCES has uh, preceded us much earlier on this, but we have um, created working groups which are dominated by graduate students. And there we get the graduate students to actually apply to be part of the working group. Um, so we can make sure that um, we can do good matchmaking, as Marisa put it. Um, and we can also ensure that we get like the full complement of skills, we get uh, gender balance, we get uh, balance in other uh, demographies. Um, so uh, we can really make a diverse uh, uh, participant. Okay, I think we uh, still have one last uh, Q&A question. And I do have a last, last question also. Um, the question is from Marina Volosovsky, uh, but I think the question is from Blangina Viana, Blangi, and she is asking about um, citizens, citizen science project. So I was wondering if the centers are already carrying on synthesis based on data from citizen science projects. Are uh, we? Currently do not have a, a active group on using citizen science data, um, but I know that in the past, 
others have at least looked into it and often used um, those data. They are um, you know, new data sources like that or data from social media uh, that you can scrape and harvest are, are really exciting frontiers of how we can fill gaps or leverage a, a more diverse set of information to understand things. So uh, yes, it's a great idea. And no, we don't have anything active right now. And I couldn't name the census center who's behind some of these papers, but uh, often um, a working group might need to illustrate something with um, a data example. And some of the go-to examples there are some of the, uh, the breeding bird um, or the uh, Christmas bird survey or eBird. Uh, these are kind of frequent go-to places. Um, though I, I can't give you a specific reference uh, for that. Okay, I think we are close to the end of this uh, webinar, but I want to, to hear you both uh, uh, about one issue that is particularly important uh, for symbiosis. Uh, I think Diane, you, was involved and she, she came, came to Brazil in, in, in a meeting. And Ben, I don't know if you know, but the idea of symbiosis is to have a physical center. So we think that it's important to have this support, physical support center. But I know that at the same time, CIE is a virtual uh, synthesis center. So which are the advantages and disadvantages of these two formats. So to have as NCs, to have the physical center supporting people and, and making them uh, coming to the same place and interacting. And uh, in comparison to, to a more virtual uh, center where people are more free to meet, uh, I don't know, in, in natural reserves or nice uh, landscapes and so uh, I really would like to hear the opinion from you both about advantage and disadvantage of a physical center. I'm sure we both could spend hours talking about this because we think about it a lot, but I'll keep my thoughts brief. Uh, I think the key thing we've, we've spoken to is getting people together in person. And we know this is challenging right now, but it's just so fundamentally important to um, a lot of the synergy and creativity that comes out of working groups. As Diane said, the like conversations that happen at coffee break or at lunch are as important, if not more important than the discussions that happen during the meeting. And you just don't get that in a virtual setting. So whether you meet at some beautiful field station or at the infrastructure of a physical synthesis center, is probably less important. It's the getting together that I think is critical. What having a, a, a physical place enables is a lot of the infrastructure that can help really support these working groups. So we have you know, all the logistics dialed in and really efficient. We have the, the informatics and computer support team there and ready in person. We have analysts who can sit in on the group at key moments to help advise what you might need to do to advance, you know, some of the ideas or research you're doing. So the physical proximity of all of those resources is just creates a lot of advantage. So I'm a huge advocate of that. I've also done, you know, offsite groups where you're a lovely <laughs> hotel in the mountains or something like that, which is inspirational and wonderful in a different way. Um, it is, of course, challenged by the logistics that come with that. So anyway, there's some brief thoughts on that question. So CIE does not have a physical center and um, that is um, really a matter of uh, the, the funding circumstances that we found ourselves in when this was started um, uh, more than a dozen years ago. Um, so um, uh, our federal funding agency doesn't have a program that allows us to apply for funds uh, for the infrastructure for a census center. Um, instead, 
uh, the patch together solution is we get our funding um, by, from some of the major research universities in Canada, as well as from the, Scient the Scientific Society in Canada for Ecology and Evolution through membership fees. Um, so we have a small budget uh, and that cannot support a physical center. Um, so that means that uh, when some, somebody applies for us for funding, um, they take on the organizational role uh, at that point. So, um, you know, we basically move the money to uh, their university, they have it in an account, and they use that to uh, pay for the meeting costs and the travel and so on. Um, so it's extra work for that organizer. Um, and that takes up time, and that time, you know, comes from the rest of their activities. So, um, you know, it, it takes away from the science. Uh, so there's there is a cost there uh, for the for that organizer. On the other hand, here are some of the benefits. Uh, so um, it means not everybody is traveling to the central location. It can be based, um, you know, where the organizer is, um, which can reduce uh, carbon costs. Um, it also makes the CIE quite flexible. Um, so one thing that has happened with other census centers around the world is, um, you know, they've had kind of a 10 year lifespan. Um, that is the uh, funding body is very excited about them. And then, you know, 10 years in there, the funding body go, moves on to other shiny objects in the funding landscape. Um, and so that does create a bit of this dependence on um, federal funding does create a certain fragility. Um, and infrastructure costs a lot. The people, the staff in that infrastructure costs a lot. Um, you know, uh, NCS has done very well in continually kind of reinventing itself to get over these challenges. Um, CIE has had a different approach and that has kind of allowed us to weather the pandemic really well uh, because we didn't have the liability uh, of the infrastructure. So pros and cons. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Ben. I'm seeing Carlos Jolie. I don't know if um, Carlos wants to say some words at the end. I just want to thank uh, ben, uh, ben and uh, Diane for the uh, marvelous afternoon, for us at least afternoon, uh, we had with uh, both talks. I think we are in a critical moment in terms of establishing this kind of uh, research here in Brazil and uh, all the uh, advice we can have, it's very stimulating and uh, bring us closer to our main objective that is uh, getting this kind of research established here in Brazil. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Carlos. So I, I joined Carlos uh, in, in, in thank you um, you both, Diane and Ben, and the whole audience uh, for this afternoon. It was really very stimulating and very nice to, 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 to have your presentation. So very good presentation, nice discussion. I want also to thank uh, CNPq and FAPESP for their support uh, for this event and also for all the uh, initiative in developing uh, citizen science in Brazil. Also, for passive communication staff, Vera and, and Maleci, and especially also Marisa from CPQ, who co organized this event. I don't know if she wants to appear <laughs> now at the end, but thank you very much, Marisa. And I think that's it. I think uh, we have good ideas, good discussions, and a lot to think about. And Thank you all. Have a good weekend, both, and we keep in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. Pleasure. Bye bye.